long for my head to be worn like this, so I'm going to turn it round. Otherwise, the blazing lights that Brian has set up for us here, Brian's on camera, are going to shine off my balding head, and no one wants that. Jamie, of course, is still away at the moment, looking out for various things in the wilderness. She will be coming through shortly, and of course, as the only feminine member of this presenting team, she is going to be a crucial part of the fireside chat, because, of course, we are talking about mothers this evening. We've got a number of motherly clips to show you. Obviously, we had a very motherly afternoon today with the perfect mother that is Karula, the queen of Juma. Also, Jamie, of course, with a herd of elephants that seem to perform marvellously throughout the course of the afternoon. And, of course, that little one that was playing in front of you had a mother, inevitably, as do all of us. Right. OK. So the first thing we're going to have a look at to do... Oh, and... Um, <laughs> Sorry, question coming to you, a very confusing one here. Um, right, uh, Mother Nature has sent through a question. I see now why I was confused. Uh, Mother Nature, you say if uh, big cats uh, are cats, why are their little ones called cubs and not kittens? Well, Mother Nature, I guess it's kind of a sort of, a, it's, a, it's an English language convention. Very few of the words that we use out here are in fact biological terms. So a very good example would be uh, the collective nouns that we use. Dazzle of zebra, for example, uh, the English convention of using bull and cow for anything larger than a nyala, and you and ram for anything smaller than that. It's an English convention. So for the big cats, we tend to use the term cubs, and all of the smaller cats from the genus Felis, which would include African wildcats and servals and caracals, we'd call them kittens. And of course, your house cat is also known as a kitten, Mother Nature, if you have a house cat, of course. If you don't, well, then you don't really refer to kittens at all, do you? OK, now we're going to wait for Jamie to arrive before we play the Karula clip. Uh, which will probably take another, I don't know where she is. So, Rebecca, perhaps you could give us an indication of how long that's going to be. She's one minute away. Okay. Uh, Samuel, your uh, impressions of Mother Day, Mother's Day thus far? Well, James, I had a fantastic day today. We woke up this morning, and myself and David went out, and we found a buffalo herd. And just after that, we came across a lunar moth, which was really cool. I've never seen a lunar moth. But just because those were like the most incredibly beautiful moth, I just thought of my mother on that. At that mm -hmm. moment, I just saw the most incredible comet in the sky there. A comet. <laughs> comet. Shooting star. Shooting star. Yes. <laughs> and um, and uh, continuing the drive, it was just an incredible day. And then finding that female lioness, which I'm convinced is pregnant. And it was just cool to see her because I've seen her three times now. And to see her on Mother's Day and to see that she could potentially be, become a mother today on Mother's Day, got me quite excited. So it's been a really nice day, a nice day to think about my mother, to see a lot of life out there that has mothers and learn a little bit of something else from the world outside. Mm -hmm. Marvellous. And, um, <laughs> sorry, I've got a wonderful comment coming through here from Gracie, aged eight. And Gracie, you say, can we give a happy Mother's Day to your mother? But Gracie, only because it's you, but yes, absolutely. A happy Mother's Day to Gracie's mum, and you made her a turtle picture, I think you said, and you loved the leopard mama that we saw today. Well, I'm very glad you did, Gracie, and I hope that you and your mum have had a wonderful Mother's Day. On that note, Gracie, the most incredible drawing of that elephant, it was very, very sweet. I just want to say that you're an amazing drawer, and you must continue to draw for as long as you can. And perhaps one day you'll be able to come out here and teach me how to draw, <laughs> because I am a terrible drawer. Sam, you're not too bad. I enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jamie is herring her way in here at 150 miles an hour. My mother, of course, is down in the Eastern Cape. I'm 99% sure she is not watching this broadcast. She will be currently, for the first time, I have to tell you this, everyone, for the first time, and I think the uh, 45 years that my parents have been married, and my father produced a bouquet of flowers on Mother's Day today. My family's never done Mother's Day, so for the first time in my 40 years, and my parents, oh, 46 years they've been married, actually, my mother has finally had a gift on Mother's Day, and I'm sure she's most 
pleased with that. Um, uh, we're just a bit, little bit worried that now a standard has been set and we're all going to have to do something for Mother's Day, which is, of course, a very worrying thing. Mother's Day, a big thing in your family? Uh, it is, it is a, good, a good day in our family. Um, yes, I lost my mother when I was a young boy, so I always think of these, these moments, these days where I can think about her. And so it was nice to spend it out in the middle of the bush thinking about my beautiful mom, whose name was Nikki. So my dad's name was Nick. My mother's name was Nikki. So I, always, I really enjoyed being out okay. in the bush for that. Cool. All right. Okay, we're going to move on to the Karula clip. Jamie's going to make her way in here. But have a look at the wonderful Queen of Juma, the most successful leopard mother that I've ever known. Karula is the Queen of Juma and a true inspiration to all of us who've been lucky enough to follow her. She's 11 years old and has been part of the Wild Earth family since we started in 2007. She successfully raised eight cubs to adulthood in all the time we have known her. And just when we thought that she could be retiring, in February 2016 she did it again. brand new cubs, who are currently three months old. Happy Mother's Day, Karula. So, a fantastic shot there of the Queen of Juma and her great skills as a mother. And of course, we've probably had better shots of that just today alone, which has been a wonderful privilege for all of us. And perhaps you could take us through your morning with her today. Well, I think our morning was absolutely astounding. It's the second time that I've seen those cubs properly and to spend a proper amount of time with them. And watching the, the slightly smaller one with the brownish eyes and the way that I, I suspect she's a female. I don't know if you managed to confirm today or not. I would agree, but I, I, yeah. I, I, I suspect, I got a look. but it's not, yeah. it's not 100% no. confirmed. But she was behaving very independently and wandering about the tree and then going to the carcass, jumping on the carcass and then coming back. The male was, in my, during my sighting, was just resting with mom and having a bit of a feed. But the, the suspected female was just all over the show. It was incredible to watch and to see that coordination and dexterity sometimes, I mean I know they, they fall over occasionally, but from something that is this big and so incredibly young, watching them spring up the trees and behave like mm. little miniature predators mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. Lucy Spaulding, thank you for your question. You want to know who we think the best mother is, well other than our own mothers of course. Um, Sam, best mother you've seen out here so far? Well, just on that, you know, on the topic of uh, the elephants and Elvis the Ellie, um, we've just kind of been following elephants over the last two days, and I just think that the mother elephants provide such inspiration towards a leader in a group, and uh, the matriarch, and spending some time with how they look after and rear their young, and I've been reading lots about it and now experiencing it, and I just feel, get that feeling mm -hmm. that the, the mother elephant has a huge contribution the life of the whole herd and taking it to the different parts of the savanna when it's going through different periods of drought or, mm -hmm. or difficulty. So it's, it's amazing what a mother can do from an elephant's perspective for the bush archer. So right. inspired so, by so, that. So for you it's elephant. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. It's okay, I'm not laughing at you. You can, you, you can have that opinion. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Lucy, it's a difficult one. I mean, you know, the, the much maligned spotted hyena really is, yeah. they, they're some of the most extraordinary mothers out there. And they care and are so protective of those little cubs. And they, they lactate for so much longer than any of the other predator species, right, right up to a year, even recorded to a year and a half, mm. that they will feed their cubs off milk, which mm. is quite extraordinary. It's quite extraordinary use of their own resources to keep something alive. But I think in terms of, of animals that have a difficult time, and leopard has a really tough mm. time raising cubs, and then rhino as well. And watching a, a, a rhino mom with his yeah. baby is, is an 
ex unparalleled experience. Yeah, it is a delight. And Kat, in Tampa, you, you want to know if there's ever a stage where a mother will sacrifice herself in order to feed her youngsters and uh, sort of to, in a tough time if there's a drought, would a mother ever sacrifice herself in order to feed the cubs? Um, to me that's not really possible of course because once dry times come and drought conditions uh, subsist or persist, a female will stop lactating and that will inevitably result in the death of the youngsters. But what is interesting is that we often get asked because many of you out there are mothers and you know that you would do anything for your children and that you would do anything to make sure that they were safe and there are very few animals out here that do the same thing and there's a very good reason for that and that reason of course is that if the mother dies for example if were Karula if Karula was to have a fight with a hyena tonight if she was to become injured those cubs would die anyway so she's not going to risk herself in order to save the cubs and people often find that a little bit difficult mm. to comprehend. So in a social species, you'll have much more protectiveness because, of course, there is a support network. And I think you find in an elephant herd especially, Absolutely. you would find a mother sacrificing herself and her own safety for her youngsters. Mm. But amongst the solitary predators, amongst, I, I imagine, even the impala, and any animal that doesn't cross-suckle, and cross-suckling means when an unrelated female will still sort of play wet nurse to the youngsters. And any species like that, cat, you really are not going to get any kind of sacrifice. And <laughs> wonderful question coming through here from Coda Karula. And Coda Karula, you were named after Karula, and you would like us to send a happy Mother's Day to your mother. Happy Mother's Day to Mrs. Coda Karula? Kay Simpson, I think. There we go. I think it's Kay, Kay Simpson. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so very happy much. Mother's happy Day. Mother's Day to you. Marvelous. And then the the <laughs> I'm getting hit with some astonishing questions here. <laughs> um, I'm going to get hand this over to uh, to Sam. Sam, um, I've been asked whether <laughs> I've been asked whether or not I am the mother of the camp because I feed the cameraman things and I've now cut your hair. Mm. Do you see me as a motherly <laughs> figure? You know, James, mm. I definitely find you as a, as a good mentor because mm. you've had a good experience mm. in the bush, but mm. mother would be the wrong word, I think. I'm uh, glad you say that, yeah. Sam. Yes. <laughs> you know, with the, with the haircut story, that was more, you know, no one was interested. No. And I, I don't trust <laughs> myself with a pair of scissors. Nor should you. Yeah, and I think I, it's good to trust in a friend, and I trust it, and yes. I think it looks good. So yeah, I think it looks exceptional. It does. Yeah. It does look good. Very well yeah. done, Mom. Thank you. James. Well done, James. Thank you. So yes, you're, you're one of you is going to end up in the fire <laughs> if you're not very careful. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, you're wondering about the most fiercely protective mother in the bush. Well, Sam's about to find out about that because he keeps going off to Bufalshook Dam to have a look for that lioness who's giving birth to those cubs soon. And what you do not want to do, we've, you've seen probably us all go off looking for lions on foot. Uh, you're going to be a lot more reticent to go off into a drainage line with thick bush if you know there's a lioness there with her cubs. She will be fiercely, fiercely protective. That's why I didn't even think about walking into that drainage mm. line this afternoon. And apparently she's been hanging around there for a, a, a considerable yeah. period of time. Mm. She might even have actually given birth mm. in the last few hours. And there's nothing quite like the sound a lioness mm. makes when you've disturbed her and threat and she feels that you've threatened her cubs. Yeah, it is... It is bone chilling. Mm. Bone chilling? No one wants to have chilly bones, everyone. Okay, we have our next clip here. We're going to move on from the cats onto the large elephants that Jamie spent much of the time this afternoon with. So have a look at this. There we go. That's the half trunk female. We've been seeing her a while. Now, she's got a new calf who's there, just in your picture there, only about three or four weeks old, probably, maybe up to six weeks. Then she's got two others who are normally with her, we think, both her offspring. The one probably coming up behind, and then I think uh, the one far behind there. Right, then she's got two more friends today. We haven't seen these ones before with her. The first one that Dave started on looks like a pregnant female. She looks like she might give birth fairly soon. That's the one on the left-hand side of your screen. And then in the far distance, the half-trunk female's other... It could be a sibling, could be her very first offspring. So her little herd, which is normally just four, has swelled to 
six. I think that that elephant cow is uh, certainly my favourite, and I've just heard from Jamie that she's Jamie's favourite as well. Absolutely. She's a lovely, lovely elephant cow, and of course so characteristic because she's lost that little piece of her trunk there. So I think it's about a third, mm. a bottom yeah, third of the trunk or so. Right. And it's made no difference in her life. She's managed to adapt, and so much of the time, I mean, this is not a particularly motherly conversation, but so much of the time we have a situation where we find an animal, it's injured, and people say, oh, aren't you going to help it, aren't you going to help it? And you know what, 90% of the time, these animals recover from the most tremendous injuries and they just get on with life, they compensate and they, they survive. Now, I want to know from you what you think. Um, you've seen these elephants as well, this herd. I haven't, okay. I haven't, you haven't this, this, encountered this, this particular lady. Um, she's moving around with three well, others. Yes, one yeah. very obviously one small very, calf, yes. one probably five or six-year-old, and one maybe seven-year-old or so. Mm. And I don't know that that slightly older one is her youngster or a sibling. What do you think? I, I, I've always suspe I always initially suspected that it was a, 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 her oldest daughter, because mm. it is a female. Just because I, I would, I've had difficulty picturing the split that must have occurred from the herd that would have enticed um, another female from a, the core of the herd to move away with mm. her. But it does happen, so it's not impossible, mm. and you're right. I mean, the snared trunk elephant, that lovely lady, she's quite a young, she's quite a she young, young cow. Yeah. And uh, almost young to the point that that oldest female with her might not actually physically be possible to be in her yeah. calf, if that makes sense. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, the dynamics between them is very close. It could well be a sister. Yeah. The, the, the sort of the next sister after her, or a calf that was born after her. Either way, what I've noticed with her behavior is she entrusts a great deal, which is typical of elephant herds, but interesting in this tiny one. She entrusts a lot of care to of that young, that new mm. female calf, the tiny, tiny baby, to the she, she to the others, yeah. especially that female. Mm. And, it is, and the, the, the young male also takes quite a lot of responsibility yeah. where that's yeah, concerned, that. which is inter it's, it's fascinating. It's a lovely little family dynamic that they've yeah. got going on. Aaron, um, you're interested in which babies become independent the soonest. Now, of course, when you start talking about things like this, everybody thinks of mammals. And we always think of mammals and which mammals will become independent. Most of the youngsters out here, of course, because they're born to insects and arachnids and other invertebrates, are independent from birth. And so if we take an example of I was reading up on the striped skink because I saw one the other day and knew nothing about it. They give birth to live young, interestingly enough. They're called viviparous reptiles. But those youngsters experience no parental care at all. So there are many, many species out here that receive absolutely zero parental care. Of the mammals, Sam, which, what do you think goes independent the soonest? Mm. I'm trying to rack my brains here. Yeah. Well, independence is a difficult question yeah. because, I mean, there's independence in, in the form of being weaned yeah. Yeah. Um, and able to survive without the mother. But then there's also, like, the impalas, they're weaned very, very quickly. Mm. They start to, to feed off solid food very quickly, but they're still within the protection of the herd. Yeah, cool. So are they completely independent? Well, probably, yes. I mean, they, they mm. don't need their mothers for survival. Yeah. But us. Antelope species, I think, for mammals makes yeah. the most sense to me. I suppose any antelope or um, other kind of small herbivore, yeah. zebra as well. Yeah. With, the, with the wildebeest, though, the wildebeest are obviously with the mig migrating ones. They're moving at far distances you know, mm -hmm. in, in Africa, so they get born. They have something like, from what I read, like five minutes that they are able to run yeah. after birth. Which, I mean, I know with an independence, we were talking about what independence away from the family group. But that's still quite remarkable that it is, yeah. you can be able to run after five yeah. minutes of being born. We certainly know the opposite answer because mm -hmm. the, the baby with the longest independence, of course, is the human being. And that <laughs> seems to be getting longer and longer. Some Sometimes of my friends are happens. still at home. Yes, I mean, my parents would probably consider me slightly semi-dependent still. And I'm approaching my uh, fifth decade. That's a scary thought. Okay. Let's move on from the elephants, and we've got the semi-cat, semi-dog creatures that enthrall us almost on a daily basis, living up at Aubrey's Road. Let's have a look at the hyena clan. Oh, another big yawn from Mom. It's exhausting looking after that little bundle of fur. November's mother, Pretty, is because she's actually pretty. Corky is 
Corky because when she we first found her, when she first moved to the communal den site, she kept sitting in the entrance to the dens and blocking the way for the cubs to come out. And there's Mom giving us a happy upside down smile, a matriarch's grin. Your babies are doing very well, Mummy. God. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, ah. <laughs> we should be live actually. I'm, we are live. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, some warning next time would be very useful indeed. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. I think we were probably live for five seconds there. Thankfully, nobody said anything too bad. But we, we can't just, see the moon. We cannot see the Well, we can see the moon, but you yes. can't see the moon. It's behind a very large jackalberry tree. Anyway, that was the hyenas. And we get asked a lot about matriarchal societies, possibly the ultimate matriarchal society. Sam, you were talking about the elephants and their matriarchy. You spend a bit of time up there. Your impressions of the hyenas, they've given you a bit of a, a run mm, around? Mm. No, I've had some fun times with those hyenas. Huh? It's just running, they've been running around the sandy patch and coming back to the dens and with the wildebeest that was eaten the other day. And it's been fascinating to read about how they would share, how the mother actually doesn't share some of her feed. Um, and, and, but then some, she actually did at one point. She, she was so full. Mm. I've never seen a female hyena, well, not that I've seen thousands, but she was the fullest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so compared to that and that female lioness, who I'm pretty convinced is pregnant, this is the fullest. The fullest the, mammal you've ever seen. <laughs> I've ever seen. But it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Even spending time with those cubs and the way in which they are looked after and how they play. I just am just inspired by the way in which the, the young hyenas will play with each other at a young age like that and mm. pounce and do all sorts of cool things mm. with each other. So fascinated by the behavior of the, of the hyena. James, Richard, uh, a nice one from you. Do we think that, or well, do I think, do anybody, does anyone think that certain individuals have got stronger motherly instincts than others? What do you think? I mean, the inevitable question of shadows, Shadow and success Karula. and Karula, or sh shadows, lack of success and Karula success comes up. I, d I don't think that individuals have a stronger maternal drive than others. I just don't see the possibility. Uh, it's only really in human beings that you get mm. that additional complication. But for, for animals, that maternal instinct is so, so powerful. Now, with Shadow, I've always said that personally, I, I don't think that she's a bad mother. I, I think that she's been very unlucky. Mm. And I, I don't know if maybe she's a little bit weaker than Karula. You might even find that she's actually got, maybe she hurt her jaw or something, something that prevents her from hoisting her kills because I think that's played a huge role in her lack of success. But what is interesting is that from what I can tell, Tundi, her twin sister, hasn't been all that mm. successful either. But what is it that makes Karula such an extraordinarily successful female? Yeah. I have no idea. I, I mean, I would say I think there's a huge amount of luck involved. I kind of disagree with you, and I, I know Scott and I used to disagree quite vehemently on this. Um, I think that there is a stronger ma uh, maternal instinct, and I also think that there's skill, there's talent. We have ta different talents as human beings. That's true. I've no doubt that the animals have talents in the same way. So, I mean, I don't mean it as an insult, but I don't think that Shadow can have been that unlucky that often. I think there's That's an true. element of it where she's just not as talented as, as Karula is. Why that should be the case, I don't know. Um, and who knows in the Impala? Uh, it could well be that some of them are completely incompetent mothers, but we'd never know about it, of course. And, of course, within human... I think in a social... Here's another sort of angle on it. In a social species, you'd probably more likely have that variation because yes. you do have other uh, females to look after the youngsters. But in a less social species, like the Impala, uh, it, the genetics that bred in or that... Uh, uh, predispose an animal to poor m mother motherly behavior if you like would be bred out of the out of the system yeah. quite quickly so that's quite an interesting one and of course experience plays a role as well that uh, yeah. the more experienced mothers they practice and they they learn different what works and what doesn't and you can see it you can see it in the way that elephants yeah. teach the younger females how to mother and yeah. how they practice on younger siblings and younger cousins mm. Just, just on the hyenas quickly, yeah. if, I, if I may. Oh, you may, you. Sam, you may. <laughs> You're an equal partner here. <laughs> yeah, yes. but like, I was, I've, I was been finding very interesting 
the behavior of the youngsters towards that mother. And I just think about to clear that up, you mm -hmm. know, with a, a leopard, it will treat the two relatively the same. But with a female, and a female from a hyena clan, looking after two fi females that are youngsters, she will feed the one that's more dominant than the other. Is that, that's the correct, that is they're correct, yeah. feeding the one and, until the other one actually dies off. No, no, well, that can happen. She will probably feed a slightly more dominant one, but probably because the dominant one steals mm. more effectively oh, than the younger one. And likewise, you'll probably also find that a, in a, within a hyena clan like that, uh, the a cub that dies is normally killed by its mm. sibling. Yeah. So it's not actually starved to death, it's actively killed mm. almost at birth. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so that is interesting. Um, I, I, you discovered, I think, uh, you, you correctly identified the matriarch of that hyena clan as madam. And do you remember when that was? It was, I think it was when you went on leave in January. Yeah. Because you, you discovered, James had discovered the Mbubu Road den site, that lovely den site with the big Tamburti trees around it. And he knew that there were cubs there. And we'd been watching Pretty on one side and Corky at the other den, and then they kind of moved together. It's an impala, by the way. We're not about to yeah, be we, attacked. Don't worry. We're not, we're not afraid of the noises in the dark. Mm. But M Madam then sort of entered into the scene. We've seen her before, but I'd never properly identified just how dominant she really was. And just mm. when watching, obviously, because she had the youngest set of cubs, she was present at the den site all the time. And it really gave us an incredible opportunity to watch what was happening. And I think what solidified it in my mind certainly and I think probably for most of the viewers was we had quite a, a shocking hyena fight with another mm. clan member where Madam and I think it was Pretty, well, I, I suspect Pretty is related to Madam and yeah. Corky, I suspect that they're the same female mm. line but they attacked a female, an older female who was clearly a, not as dominant, was clearly submissive and they tore her not to shreds, but they certainly did some serious damage to the point she tried to climb under the car. Mm. And watching that behavior and then the subsequent reactions of every single hyena to her presence and to the presence of her cubs, combined with the fact that her oldest cub, Bella, is a male, yes. and he is treated with a modicum of respect yeah. at the hyena den. I yeah, think that kind is, of all he? tied together. Yeah, yeah, and usually so. Yeah. Have you got enough space? I've got plenty of space, yes. Okay. Have you got enough space to dance? Um, and, no. No. Oh. <laughs> but Sam will dance, everybody. Don't worry. Oh, wow. Probably on his <laughs> hands. Um, I'm going to sing a song I've sung before, and it's the only kind of motherly type song I know. It's a Zulu song, and the words go, Oh, tulam tuanam, or mamos or figos, or patelama, sweetie. And it means, Hush, little child, your mother will soon be back, and she will give you sweets, which is, of course, a very nice thing for a mother to do. <laughs> and it just. It's a lovely little song because it reminds us, of course, of the comfort that our mothers give us. So to all of you mothers out there, I hope you've had a wonderful Mother's Day. And to those of you who have mothers like Sam, whose mothers celebrate on a different shore and in a far greater light, I hope you too draw some comfort from the day that we've had here today. We'll see you in the morning at uh, 0600. I keep forgetting the time. It's changed. And until then, stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. Here we go. O tulam tuanam, o mamu zofika, o zopatela masuiti. O tulam tuanam, o mamu zofika, o zopatela masuiti. O tulam dana mo ma mo zo fega o zo patela masuiti amna hande baka amna hande 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 O tulam dana mo ma mo zo Oso patela masuiti, oh tulam jana mama oso figa oso patela masuiti. I'm na hand back, I'm na handy, I'm na handy back, I'm na handy, 
amnan de baca amnan de amnan de baca amnan de